So welcome. We are in Santa Cruz, California, and the Dickens Project is experimenting with exploring different themes each month. And this month we have Liz Pollock with us who will be talking us about Victorian kitchens and guiding us through cocktail recipes and even, I think, plum pudding. So it should be a lot of fun. Anyone who has attended the Dickens Universe may recognize Liz as our Um, bookseller. And she just came out with a book that she wrote called The Lost Restaurants of Santa Cruz County. And it recounts the food culture from the 1940s through 1980s. Is that right? The 1980s? Or does it go through the 90s? 50 years. And she has owned and operated the Cook's bookcase since 2007, where she specializes in selling cookbooks. Liz first came to Santa Cruz for Valentine's Day Waltz at Cowell College in 1975. And she quickly transferred uh, to UCSC, where she majored in comparative literature. She met her husband at Adolph's Italian Family Restaurant, where she bartended for five years. So she is a mixologist with a lot of experience and food culture to share with us. So I'm really excited to to have Liz here with us today. Thank you, Courtney, for inviting me and for the Dickens Project. It's my favorite thing to do every year. I love to read the books every year, and this is... This is a new world we are in, but looking forward to next year as well. For my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to discuss the planning, preparation, and cooking of a dinner in a Victorian kitchen. And of course, in addition to that is the serving and then cleaning up afterwards. Okay, here's a timeline that I put together. The visual examples that I'm sharing with you today are images taken from my research of the books written during this period, highlights being those which focus upon houses in Victorian London. They have the typical features of the fictional houses and kitchens which Dickens describes in his books. Generally speaking, I believe that in Dickens novels, there is the theme that everything is about choices. His characters choose to act or decide not to act. And whether living in luxury and accustomed to eating fine food or begging, stealing, scraping by and having to make do, food is always a presence and is often an indication of a character's inner conscience. Whatever class he's talking about, Whether the characters appreciate good food and eat it with gusto with friends and family or deny oneself or another person of food or drink, Dickens uses this motif as an indicator of having a generous spirit or in contrast of being uncharitable and having an unfeeling heart. And so in my view, the kitchen in Dickens is the heart of the home. This is from Dombey, it's illustration by Hablo Knight Brown. And the major says, asks the the servant, fill it, fill this to the brim. Let us begin with the floor plans of the kitchen in the house itself. I'm going to show you four examples where it shows the food ingredients come in, the drink comes in. They're prepared, they are transformed, and then go out and up to meet the people that will eat and drink them as part of their daily life. Prince Albert commissioned the architect, Henry Roberts, to show a two-story block of four flats, and, and it shows the scullery being the center of the home, and this improved living conditions and of course thousands came to the great exhibition in london this is from 1890 from mrs beaton's so i'm going to refer to mrs beaton's quite often and 
you can see the day the windows are designed to, so daylight comes through the window, which is essential, obviously, to help food preparation. And rather than the typical built-in wall cabinets and countertops seen in today's kitchens, rather there were large, heavy cupboards or cabinets for plates, bowls, dishes, etc. There were flap drawers for utensils and kitchen implements, pails lidded baskets, storage boxes, and barrels with a central long or circular table where the cook and staff prepared the meals. It's not a big room. There's not a, but it, but it's shaped like, it, I always call it like a donut. It's a circular. There were lots of hooks that were common for hanging large pans and those were, but most often put in a cupboard or closet. The floors were usually stone slab or if wood with an oil cloth placed beneath the central work table to catch the dirt. And this was regularly shook out. If possible, there was a separate room for the pan, the, for a pantry, storage of semi non-perishable foods. There's a larder at the bottom of the screen for fresh vegetables, eggs, and perishable ingredients. Maybe a small scullery on the other end with a groove drain board for washing and cleaning up. And that often included a large wooden tub beneath the sink to catch the dirty water, which was then emptied out in the backyard or into the street. So the necessary chore day after day was stoking the coals into the stove on a regular, uh, regularly during the day, and then cleaning out the ashes early in the morning. The stove it had its own special brushes and blackening, and it was a weekly, bi-weekly, perhaps time-consuming job using these bristle brushes and elbow grease all done on one's knees. The design of the cooking range generally helped to make working in the kitchen more comfortable and convenient. This image is from 1867. So you can see P for part for pantry, larder, and then S for scullery, R for range. So of course the, the cook would keep a three to five gallon container of water hot on the range all day long. They would dump the ashes into the street. The garbage was taken out regularly and the doors were open for ventilation. But if it was particularly city and dirty outside, a muslin sheet was hung in the doorway from the American Catherine Beecher's book on, on the home. But I included, it's from 1869. I included because the image shows you, I mean, nine by nine, that's not very big. And it shows a locked closet for things the cook um, or the housekeeper didn't want to have open to the servants. I like the, the idea of sliding doors. I, I like that a lot. And you can see it's all planned out. And this was recommended for so many uh, young married women. Most houses relied upon a communal pump in the street and they sent staff out to fetch water several times a day and then heated it on the range as I described before. So Prince Albert's design for this new improved living for the poor introduced civil reform. And then decades later, when gas was introduced in the 1880s, that was a revolution for the, the cook and the, and the household. Here's a menu from Mrs. Beaton's for the month of um, November. It's a typical November day. The course is being meat, vegetable, pot, potatoes, bread, dessert, wine. The portions were adjusted for family, visitors, guests. Her books were very popular and helped enormously with organizing the household. A lot of suggestions for feeding the sick and infirm and also of course domestic 
wages, how to, what to pay the servant. This is Leadenhall Market. This is for when the cook went at, would go out to the market early. You can see the carcasses and fowl being hung up right there. This is a from the Illustrated News in 1881. The roof had just been added and it already had been an outdoor market for centuries. Besides going out to market, of course, there were the tradesmen who came down the streets. These are porters in a photograph at Covent Garden about 1877. And these tradesmen would sell goods right off of their wagons and carts. And cooks and household domestic servants would maybe have a conversation, get to know these fellows and buying their fresh eggs and fresh milk and butter, maybe pass the time of day, see each other day after day after day, you know how to rely upon each other. These young men are selling white bait. This photograph is from 1885. White bait was fished in the fish for in the Thames. It's kind of like herring. This is a hot potato seller. It's a photograph from 1890, and these were sold in hot in cold weather. Here's that communal pump. It's from the Holton Picture Collection from 1855. And again, the meeting with tradesmen and, and food sellers was a, a, a social, social network, if you, if you like. So back inside the kitchen, you can see the large hooks being used to hang up onions there and, and fowl. They were waiting to be gutted and cleaned, peeled, plucked, dressed, chopped, prepared for roasting, steaming, broiling. And this seems to me a staged photo. It's from the Holton picture collection as well. Here is a circular round table, uh, a wooden central, central, a central, a center. And you can see the pots and pans hanging up on the sideboard. Also from the Holton Picture Company, here are some servants working so nicely together. This is from 1890. And it, it shows one of the servants sitting down, which was, which was nice to see. One of the things I collect personally is ephemera pieces, bill of lading, letterheads, I love it. And this little label from 1845, it's a fish sauce mm, that's very popular condiment. It was like a, like Worcester sauce or A1. They, they put it on all kinds of meats. This is a label from 1815. And it's fruiterer. Just love the graphic here. Okay, so I'd like to come back to the stoves here. The This is an illustration from Miss, Mrs. Beaton's book, 1861. Here's the stove is on top. It's a simple open range. At the time in the 1860s, it cost from anywhere from three pounds to seven and seven and a half pounds but it was a big inv investment for the kitchen. It was nice because it, it fit really snugly into an established fireplace. The bottom figure shows how a place for roasting and, and uh, I, think, I think a really good cook, and the, this is really important, is learned how to control heat and that all day, all afternoon, all night to control the heat for the stove and how to learn how to use it. This is from 1900. It's also English. It's cast iron. There's a removable tray below for ashes. 
And in 1979, this sold for 180 pounds. These are oil stoves designed really for fishing boats and, and yachts, slow burning. It was heating and cooking. I include this, although it's American, because I love the scroll work. This company had a, a wide range of ranges, expensive to practical. At the top here, on the, the top had seven inch burners, and there were six of them. And at the time in 1898, this was $40. It also has, it, it's nice because on the side was an ash pit and then on the other side was a fire box. So very practical and very beautiful. I love it. To clean these stoves, to keep them shiny, you had to order on a regular basis bristles and brushes and, and this is Verinder and Sons. This is Mrs. Beaton suggests always being careful to pay creditors on time and to put these receipts um, and invoices or statements or whatever into a little box. And then that cook would give that to the master or mistress of the house a couple times a month or on a regular basis. This is neat because this shop is just located a couple blocks away from Charles Dickens' house. This is from 1854. And 242 Borough is still a market today. This is a receipt from 1856. It's located on Mark Street, Mark Lane was very close to London Bridge. It sold good, strong coffee. In 1995, I wanted to say that the auction house Sophie's had a huge catalog and sale of Victorian cooking stuff in, um, in their catalog. And they included saucepans, pots, butcher blocks. And this is a, a pie pan with a crimper. Um, one of the things I like are these tips to make your food easier, just, you know, little nice hints so that the crust on the casserole is nice and uh, crispy is put an egg wash on it, but you, you put it on the outside of the lid. I like that. Back to the salt piece catalog, excuse me. And there you see the gigantic kettles. They're lined in tin, big butcher blocks, and the molds. Victorians were really into molds. These are Staffordshire bowls, earthenware, Staffordshire. The bottom one is from about 1850, uh, excuse me, 1815 to 1830. The middle one is 1860 with the blue rim, which is common. And the top is from 1890. Off the kitchen, there was a room where the rabbits and pheasant and so forth were, were plucked and skins were taken off and, and bones and drippings and everything were sold to the fellmonger. And that was kind of like a a perk for the cook, a little extra money to be made. The wages for the cook annually were from about 40 to 50 pounds a year. And that included sugar and beer. And I cite Charles Dickens' own son's book, A Dictionary of London in 1888. Back to the stove, here we go. And although this is American, it kind of um, shows you, I wanted to show you the different containers that, that were available. Stunk, it was made of paraffin and hard to deal with. And aren't we glad we don't have to do that anymore? 
an engraving from 1860 of the port of Bristol. And it shows the ships bringing in casks of sherry and Madeira and wines. And that's a floating dock. And then they would, the people would buy the wine from these merchants and stock their cellar. This is in Paul Mall. Let's see, this is from a Illustrated News of the World in 1859. So pe people, of course, they ate at home, but they had to go out once in a while. And this is Simpsons in 1860. It was a tavern where there's evidence that Carlisle and Dickens ate there. It was famous for its rolling trolley with a very elaborate carving of roast beef. I include this image from Rundell's book of 1807. And the reason why, why I do, <clears throat> besides being an incredibly well-written, it could be written today, everybody had this book uh, in, the, in the 19th century. So the raised crust for a meat pie, boil water with a little fine lard, and an equal quantity of fresh dripping or of butter, but not much of either. While hot, mix this with as much flour as you will want, making the paste as stiff as you can to be smooth, which you will make it by good kneading and beating it with a rolling pin. And there are a lot of fantastic images in the book. I didn't have space to to share those with you, but she describes it as in good steps so that a cook would be able to follow. Very, very, very well, good descriptions. So did the cook collect recipes? Yes, she did. In a small keepsake box, she consulted with the butcher, or fishmonger, or family member, or shared recipes with a neighbor or read a column in the Illustrated London News Magazine. There is, of course, the, the vogue and influence of a famous hotel chef like Alex, Alexis Sawyer. And for really well people, they would hire a French trained cook. There were lots of cooking schools. There were schools for servants where young girls would be shown how to work in a house. And this particular image, although American, it's from Marion Harlan's book from 1898. And I, I show it because there is the, the gas, no wood, no more coal, much more efficient, much cleaner for the house, healthier for the house. And Combating dirt, filth, insects, disease was an everyday reality. And I feel that Dickens' books helped to point this out and perhaps helped to correct these problems in a concrete way. And also, of course, helped by his illustrate the illustrations and emphasized the, the home and what is finally so fascinating to me about Victorian kitchens is to compare and contrast their design with our 21st century kitchen. We have so many conveniences and, and appliances, and we have a wider variety of ingredients and more variety of styles in cooking. And maybe we don't have a servant, but we have some family who can help us cook and make dinner together. It continues to make the kitchen the heart of the home and it's the place where the family surrounds the table. This is Dickens' own pint pot. And my next presentation will be about drinks and cocktails and punches in the Victorian era. era. And I will be demonstrating how to make a couple of these favorite drinks and in Dickens. And as a side note, I'd like to say that I had the most wonderful time being a student at UC Santa Cruz. I majored in comparative literature. 
and I especially enjoyed my classes with John Jordan in the Dickens classes. And so I'm ready for your comments and your questions. I was curious, Liz, you talked about the vendors, the street vendors. Were these all independent? I mean, if, if someone was selling eggs and they, their chickens laid the eggs if they were selling whatever, were they independent or were there, were there people who were selling for farms outside of London and bringing the product in? I mean, how did that work? I think the last, what you described, there, of course, there are people who raised their own chickens and grew their own vegetables, and, but mostly it came from the country and mm. uh, these people were hired, maybe it's family members if, if they were involved but it's a long way to drive your draft horse in. And I think the porters were hired, yes. I can research that a little bit more and get back to you. Is there any chance you can post the ingredients for some of the cocktails you're going to do next time around? So that you, you we, bet I will. We can yeah. practice with you? Absolutely, you bet I will. I'm gonna get those to Courtney as soon as I can. Liz, could you talk about keeping the stoves warm. So before gas, did most people use wood to yeah. in their firewood. stoves and, and not not coal, right? Right, so firewood. So you had to buy that or go out and gather it. But usually, if you were in the city, you had to buy it and you had to store it. And depending on your finances and and, you know, it was hard work, six in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, more than that, depending on. How did they keep their perishables fresh? Did they shop every day for, you know, ducks and? Depending on how they kept them. I mean, a lot of the, the larder and pantries were cold and lids on everything. Baskets had lids, tight fitting lids on barrels and or certainly not a refrigerator, but maybe perhaps a, an ice box, a box of, for ice. Mm -hmm. But how wonderful to have somebody come down the street every day and kind of like grub hub <laughs> with, with milk and eggs. And it's fantastic. And, and of course, going to market and getting your vegetables and the the seller knows you and you know who to avoid and who to go to. You mentioned that the pots were lined with tin. What purpose did that serve? Were they copper pots lined with tin? Yeah, those copper pots are lined with tin. I, I'm, I don't understand the mechanics of it. I know they were expensive and they were really heavy. And a lot of the molds were tin, like the pudding molds. Liz, could you explain what exactly was done when people were blacking their stoves? I've always wondered about that. The reason for it? Yeah, and what they were doing, is it is it keeping the outside of the stove clean? Or right. I just don't understand what they were doing. Right. I, I don't know if any of you have read the misread books, the village, and, and some of the characters who keep the, the school stove clean and blackened. Well, it's, it's so that the, uh, the outside doesn't dry, doesn't dry out and get rusty and so forth. And then all of the soot have to clean that out. And there's a, there's a keeping the feet of the stove clean as well. So it's not doesn't cake on with the creosote. So it was primarily a cosmetic thing, is that what you're saying? No, no, to, to, to so the, it wouldn't rust out. Oh, okay. Right, okay. get grease, all the grease and so forth. So in it some ways- an, It was an investment in, in the household. I mean, you better take care of it. Well, yeah, you said $40 for that stove in 1899, that's about $1,300 now. 
I mean, that in, in, in today's dollars, that's a substantial piece of change. That's a lot of money. Yeah. What about the poor people? What what did they have in their kitchens? Was it just a fire? Oh boy, I I don't know. They would well. Did, did they buy? They can, they buy from the sellers on the street and yeah i've heard they, that they, they went out and bought food instead of cooking it and through the churches i know i've heard from my grand great grandparents in in brooklyn uh, they used to take like you know if they had something to roast they would take it to a place that would cook it for them and then they would bring it back and I don't know if they did that in England as well, but I always thought that was fascinating. That's fascinating. I'll, I'll have to look that up. I know Jewish families would take things to the bakers and have them have the food cooked by the bakeries, especially for Sabbath when they weren't allowed to cook at home. So breads well, and casseroles and things. Oh, I see. Here in Santa Cruz, there were a lot of hunters. There still are hunters. And this one man, Lou Fuseli, owned Fuseli. It's a big restaurant on the west side. And when he would bring back um, his deer, he'd, first of all, he'd stored in the ice plant, in the ice factory, the ice, called Union Ice Plant. And then he'd um, have it dressed uh, have a butcher help dress him, dress the, the deer. And it, so it was a communal effort. But no, I don't know about taking uh, something to have it roasted or baked. That, that's interesting. Never heard that before. Uh, again, and as I think it was Julie who said, I mean, these were Jew Jewish great grandparents. So it may be a cultural thing. I don't know. Did Victorians like to cook with gadgets? Do they have like all these little kitchen gadgets and gizmos? Well, they sure had a lot of knives, different shapes of knives and reasons that you would only use that knife for that thing. And of course, all of the molds, a lot of edges and molds and you would use for the season and a lot of entertaining that I, I like. I like the socialness of it, you know. And every every drink had its own special glass and the tankards for the one I showed you of Charles Dickens and the, the punch, was it the bishop punch you were talking about? With instead of a punch bowl, it would ha it had a kind of a jug that you keep hot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all kinds of ga gadgets. I like seeing your picture of Simpsons. That restaurant appears quite regularly in the Sherlock Holmes stories. He and Watson are always going off to Simpsons to have roast beef from the cart. Wow, I didn't know that. That's neat. So I've added bibliography to the chat. It's a PDF. It's four pages long, and this is a bibliography that, that Liz put together for us based on the sources that she used in today's talk. Thank you. And for, for next week, do we have any special requests for, for cocktails? I know that Liz is, has some in mind. I, I was looking up cocktails, and I found some really extraordinary recipes and also some really simple ones. And I was like, oh, I, I should try this one. One of them was, I, I told Liz about this, a black velvet and it's half Guinness and half champagne. I have to wonder how that tastes. Well, you mentioned Hot Bishop, which is mentioned in, uh, in A Christmas to Carol. I'd love to know how that's put together. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. I'll do that one. And then the black velvet, you say? Okay. I can do that one on my own. Oh. But Elizabeth has requested something based on gin. Okay. All right. So 
We'll be sharing the recipes as soon as possible. If you are not already in touch with me, just add your, send me a, a message with your email and I'll make sure that, that I email you the, the recipe and the ingredient list so we can try these ourselves. And, and yeah, so we'll be working on drinks next week and then baking on the third week. I'd like to do a, a plum pudding. Ooh, and I'll, I'll have a list of ingredients for Courtney as well. And I'll make one like the day before. And then we'll make one. And it'll be in my kitchen. And I'm not going to flame it. <laughs> I don't want to flame anything. No flaming drinks. But I'll, I'll put together something for you. <laughs> I'm also going to talk about taverns and ale houses and public houses and ordinaries and all kinds of stuff. And is Vanessa still here? Vanessa, thank you for, for sharing this link. I'm making a shameless plug for some recent work done by a Canadian journal where we were trying to explore the, the food history of the Victorian period from a position of significant ignorance. But with the help of experts like yourself, Liz, we learn a lot. So you may enjoy reading some of these very short, quite fun essays. So I share that link. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. And, and the cleaning of ovens has always troubled and interested me. So thank you. You bet. All right. So hopefully we'll see you next week. And please get in touch if, if you want me to send you the, the recipes and the ingredient list. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much, Liz. This has been fun. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.